our next introduce you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Flora Buka Court from Princeton University. Uh, hello, I'm very pleased to present my work with Tim Bushman today on a flexible model for working memory. Working memory is the ability to hold things in mind. It gives us the challenge of modeling how the brain converts a signal from a stimulus into an internal representation that persists over a delay period that are an order of magnitude larger than cellular time constants. Furthermore, the two main characteristics of working memory that any modeling study should account for are its flexibility and its limited capacity. Let me give you an example. If I show you this item on a screen for a few hundreds of milliseconds, and then nothing for a few seconds, called the delay period. Now, not only you are able to remember that it was a pink Eiffel Tower, but also that it was at the center of the screen, even though you had never seen a pink Eiffel Tower before. Working memory is flexible. We can hold anything in mind for a few seconds from the first experience and without any learning involved. If I now show you three items on the screen, you'll still be able to tell the color and location of each of them. Things get a little bit harder about, above four items. Working memory is flexible, but its capacity is limited. We model each item on the screen by a simplified ring-like sensory recurrent network of inhomogeneous Poisson spiking neurons with neurons around the ring corresponding to specific value of the uh, uh, feature, which is here color, for example. Inputs are Gaussian, and here, for example, the input is centered on the neuron uh, selective to the green color to represent a green Eiffel Tower, for example. Connections have a center surround structure, represented here as connectivity as a function of the circular distance from uh, each neuron. And going from my minus pi to pi here is equivalent to traveling along the ring of the sensory network with respect to that neuron. Maybe I can use this. Yeah. Uh, Neurons with similar selectivity share excitatory connection in red here, and more distant neurons have inhibitory connections in blue. So self-excitation is set to zero here, such that, such that the sensory network will not be able to maintain an input uh, over seconds. We model several of these sensory networks in order to represent several items at different locations on the screen, and I will always show two ring-like uh, sensory network, but in reality we model eight of them to be able to uh, increase the load in the network till number eight. Now the idea that we're going to create interferences between different sensory rings through what we call a random network. We impose the fact that there is no neuron in the random network that is specific for a specific color of if a to tower as, an, as a specific location. So instead, we create in this layer a conjunctive code, as was observed in prefrontal cortex, by projecting those eight sensory network uh, onto a smaller network, the random network. And we're going to create persistent activity by simple recurrent reverberation between the sensory networks and the random network. A simple way to have flexibility and persistent activity, meaning persistent activity for any initial input in any sensory network, while having a shared conjunctive representation in this random network is to simply make neurons in this second layer randomly and reciprocally connected to all neurons in the sensory networks. So this is what we do here. And this bidirectionality constraint on connection can be relaxed in different way, and I could talk about this offline. We set the ratio of excitatory connection to 30%, but this can be changed. So each neuron in the random network sends and receives 30% of excitatory connection, and the rest are inhibitory. And now the key idea to what a capacity effect in this network is the fact that neurons receive e equal excitatory and inhibitory drive. So the input to the entire layer is balanced. We tune the effective excitatory strength so that one input spike is created through the reverberation per input spike in the sensory network. And when the load increases, that is to say when several of our eight sensory networks receive an input, there will be interferences between representations in the sensory network. So here is a 3D simulation of the network with one initial input in sensory network one. Uh, the simulation, the stimulation, sorry, lasts 100 milliseconds, 
and the network maintains this memory during a second after the input is removed. The network is simple, does not evolve in learning, yet it is able to maintain any input to a given sensory network because of these random reciprocal connections. So it's flexible. Now here is another simulation where I increase the initial load. Six out of eight of sensory network now receive an input and some memories are not maintained over time. For example, in sensory network one and three. So the capacity of the network is limited and this is due to the interference of representation in the random network. This limited capacity is well known in humans and monkey. For example, in working memory tasks where subjects are asked to remember an increasing number of items on the screen. Uh, in both of these plots here, the y-axis is the performance and the x-axis is the set size or the loads of the working memory tasks. And our model reproduces this performance decrease as a function of set size and provides a mechanistic explanation. Within the bound of the symmetric and random connectivity implemented in this network, the limited capacity is a necessary trade-off for working memory flexibility. Because we impose equal excitatory and inhibitory drive, sorry, to all neurons, what matters is the net value of the excitatory weight. So here we display the probability of forgetting an input when only one input is presented in one sensory network. When the net excitatory weight is low, uh, the memory is forgotten. When it's high, the memory is maintained. But when it's too high, the network is creating spontaneous memories in the other sensory networks that did not get an input due to an excessive top-down drive from the random network. So we tune the network to lie exactly here on this black dot line so that the network maintain any input without hallucinating models. Now when we increase loads because, loads, because of the interference, memory representation they inhibit one another till failing. And this provides the limited capacity of the network. Uh, sorry. By staying on this dotted line, line here, uh, when the network is not creating any spontaneous memory, we retrieve here the decay in performance as a function of set size. So there is no parameter in this network that permits illimited capacity for any uh, number of initial load without creating spontaneous memories. Let's have a look at this capacity effect on single neurons. Many scientists observe tuning in sensory and peripheral cortices. Here is a figure for a monkey, from a monkey study where you see the firing rate of a lateral prefrontal cortex neuron as a function of time during a working memory task and uh, depending on the stimulus, so either the preferred color or non-preferred color uh, in dash line. In the network, neurons also have physiologically realistic turning curve. So you can see here the firing rate of sensory network one at the end of the delay period as a function of the distance from preferred color of each uh, sensory neurons. And this is obvious due to, due to the center surround uh, connectivity that we implemented. And when only one input is provided in one sensory network, this tuning uh, is inherited by the random network. Now, what's happening when we increase load? In this monkey study on the left, the firing rate of lateral prefrontal cortex neuron decreases uh, with loads uh, in red uh, and green here. It's a kind of divisive normalization like reduction in neural responses. And we retrieve the same effect in our model due to interference between memories. Here again, the firing rate of sensory neuron uh, decreases when we increase the set size, so when we had input in the other sensory networks. And we found the same result in the random network. Obviously, coding in the random network is conjunctive, but here we focus on the selectivity aligned to the first sensory network, and we add inputs to the other sensory networks. And so because of interference and an increase of effective inhibition, uh, the firing rate is decreases with low. Another key aspect of working memory capacity is memory degradation. In this study subject, they had to maintain a sample of color squared on the screen over a delay, and they were probed for one of them. And the difference between the real color and the color reported provides the circular error of the memory. And the author showed that the circular error here on the y-axis increases when we increase the number of items in uh, the initial sample. 
if we look at, at the raster, raster plot of our network, we can see that the memories are drifting over time. Uh, and due to the accumulation of, accumulation of noise in Poisson firing, and we can compute a circular error from this drift. And we were able to reproduce this parallel increase on the imprecision of recall as a function of load. Again, this is explained in the network by increased noise from interferences between a memory representation. Now, I'll quickly discuss another key electrophysics finding. This is a study where monkey were asked to perform the oculometer delay response test. So the monkey uh, see, sees one stimulus on the screen, and after a delay has to saccade to it. And the author found that the temporal dynamics of lateral prefrontal cortex neuron uh, was heterogeneous. For example, here, by looking at the time lag autocorrelation matrix, for example, during the delay, so the color bar here goes from 0.9 to 1, more or less. So this is the correlation between the neural population state at one time point and the neural population state at another time point. So when it's below one, uh, it means that the activity is heterogeneous through the delay period. But even though the activity is heterogeneous, they found the existence of a subspace capturing stimulus encoding in this high dimensional space of neural activity where the different memories are separable and stable over time. So the little cluster here are the projection of time-dependent neural activity for each stimulus. And this 2D PC space, so PCA, provides a quasi-sinusoidal encoding of stimuli, uh, where you can see on the right uh, plot here, through the projection of time average delay activity along the leading uh, PCs, principal axis. We reproduce their methods in our high-dimensional random network with eight different stimuli are presented in a single sensory network. Temporal dynamics in the network can be modified either by adding a symmetric recurrent activity uh, inside the random network or by adding Poisson noise. And we also find this coexistence of temporal dynamics together with the low dimensional subspace in which each stimulus representation is separable and stable over time. And it's the interaction with the sensory network that stabilizes dynamics into this memnonic subspace. Uh, our two leading principal axes also provide quasi-sinusoidal encoding of stimuli, and these plots were generated for an initial set size of one, as in the initial paper. So we get uh, the same qualitative result when we also vary the load in the network again. So the representational space of stimuli in the first sensory network is stable with load when we add other inputs in the other sensory networks. Uh, it could be a rotation though, so this we cannot assess through PCA. Uh, but uh, for now, uh, let's stick to that. And the only difference that we see is actually the shrinking uh, of representation in the PC space when we increase load. So what we do is that we compute the discriminability, which is a measure of the Euclidean distance in blue here between memory, memories in this PC space, corrected by the Euclidean measure within each cluster for each memory. So it's a measure describing the separability of memories. And no matter if we use the same PC space computed when the load was one, or if we recompute a new PC space for each value uh, of uh, the load here, let's do red and blue curve, the model uh, always predicts a decrease in this discriminability between memory representation as a function of load. So a detailed analysis of what's happening here is still ongoing work. So we presented a simple and flexible model through random reciprocal connection, and balancing the input to the entire random network provides, uh, in this setting, a trade-off between the limited capacity of working memory and its flexibility, and the interferences between representation provides a mechanistic account for divisive normalization like reduction in neural selectivity during working memory, memory capacity and memory drift, and a prediction on the effect of load on memory discriminability uh, in neural activity. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank mainly the Bushman Lab in Princeton Neuroscience Institute and the Brian team. So this is the spiking neural network simulator that I, that I use for this project. Thank you. OK, we have time for a few quick questions.
Hi, uh, very nice talk. Um, so, if I understood correctly, the uh, basis for the uh, change in precision with set size is drift in the model. Um, right, so, we know from human experiments that uh, the effect of delay, or it, does, it isn't the delay that produces the separation with set size in precision, it's there right from the start. So, I wondered how uh, you'd account for that. Um, can, so there's two things. There is a, the length of the delay. Mm. Sorry, the plot that I showed was after one second of the delay. But I also have the same plots over time. But I did not have time to put them here. But, but if, you were to go back to if you were to go back to zero milliseconds, then presumably you would see no difference between set sizes, which doesn't seem to fit the um, behavioral data. C can you repeat your question? I think I don't understand. So let's go back to talking so you, about this. So you're in your model, the difference yeah. between set sizes and precision that you can see there arises yeah. over time during the delay period. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. This is after one second. But right. So, yeah. The, yeah. so I'm just saying that the, uh, the human behavioral data, we, we generally find that there aren't actually very strong changes in precision as a result of the length of the delay, but the, that the set size effect seems to be present right from the start. Yeah. It's also the case here, actually. Okay, it's, Let's, uh, it's this plot actually that you're asking about. No, sorry, this one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe let's have the next speaker yeah. come up and uh, if we can manage to. Okay. Thank you, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah we, we, we can talk about this later. Yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker.